Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 598. That is 598 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing A-OK. I've just finished a hard, long, grueling days of work, so I thought, why not get back on the microphone and deliver a nice, shiny, brand new podcast to you, my faithful fans and listeners, because I'm sure in the next up and coming days, when I'm due to be away, I will not be able to do so. So why not bang out the content, get it out fast and quick for you to enjoy, because I'm sure there'll come a time in the future where I won't be able to do so. And plus, I bloody enjoy it. And it's 598 people. It's episode number 598 which is absolutely insane to think about that i've recorded nearly 600 episodes of me talking to myself into a microphone and you guys kind of like it it's absolutely crazy obviously it's not i'm not getting numbers that i would like to get but still the fact that people are still listening to it regardless is absolutely insane to me so i really do appreciate each and every one of you the interesting thing about when i started this I did start this mostly as a um, therapeutic thing. It was something that I started to kind of ease my mental turmoil and to kind of quieten my inner voice because I tended back in the day to kind of really over speak to myself to the point where people were really concerned for me. And I thought the best way to kind of get all that sort of like internal dialogue out of my head was to record myself talking to myself on the podcast, but then use the proxy of the audience to kind of make me feel much better about it and not feel like a freak. So far, it's worked pretty well. Then when I started to get into the comedy podcast, I then discovered people like Bill Burr, who has a very successful podcast where he essentially does the same thing. And his podcast, for the most part, being a fan of his, he's got like a growing family now. He's got two kids and a wife. But before that, it was just him and the wife. And he used to kind of use the podcast as an opportunity to kind of run away from his wife for a bit, get some respite and just complain and moan. You know, the classic kind of Bill Burr sort of style of comedy. And he used to really do go on some incredible rants, talking about general things that he was going through in life. And they used to sometimes form some bits that he would then go up on stage and perform but it did seem quite cathartic quite therapeutic for him when he was doing so and I did kind of resonate with him I was like you know what I think I'm the same I'm also a man that doesn't necessarily um find it easy to share my thoughts feelings and emotions with people especially off the bat i tend to be somebody that kind of runs away from getting any sort of mental um help in that way or psychiatric help so why not to why not try and self-medicate myself by talking into a microphone and so far it's done it's worked really wonders in what i'm doing at the moment especially because it's given me an outlet to be somewhat creative it's given me an opportunity to be involved in the things that i kind of like to be involved in and the things you know involved in the things i talk about here on a podcast it's kind of you know give me an excuse to kind of dip my toes in that it's given me you know all these weird connections with people online who i would kind of relate who i would kind of um you know say are my friends or kind of my e-friends i kind of speak to on a on sometimes daily basis via the dms or the comments or whatnot so that's quite nice and now i've got a little discord community so it's all going really well to be honest i can't really complain i can't really complain but yeah 600 episodes coming up i'll probably do something quite fun for that maybe i'll do like an all-day stream or something i'm not really too sure but i'll definitely plan out something to do to make it nice and special but anyway, apart from that, I'm back in the hot seat, ready to go, and I want to talk about some interesting things. Number one to talk about. Number one topic I want to get off my chest and kind of highlight to you guys, which I'm sure most of you are aware or familiar with, is House of Dragon on HBO. I'm sure most of you who have been fans of Game of Thrones are aware of this series and you know it exists, but it's two episodes in. I didn't want to talk about the first episode because I didn't think, you know, I, I was trying to make sure or was a bit worried that the first episode was a bit of a fluke. But so far, two episodes in and having kind of gone on a massive sort of deep dive on various channels on YouTube, like In Deep Geek and a few others, and researched um, the book that it's based on. Uh, I think it's like Fire and Blood and, you know, the whole story about Song and Ice and Fire and everything else around it. I can definitely say that the first two episodes of House of Dragon have absolutely knocked it out of the park. If you are somebody who was incredibly disappointed with the last three seasons of Game of Thrones, or maybe specifically um, season eight of Game of Thrones, and you was really kind of downtrodden about it, and you was kind of put off from the entire Game of Thrones franchise um, and fantasy series altogether, and you were questioning why you liked the work of George R. George R. R. Martin, I definitely would implore you, I definitely would beg you to please give house of dragon a try because it is really really good it's a bit more slow paced than game of thrones it's not as gory or action-packed as game of thrones it kind of does um 
I think somebody described it as what was that series that everyone was watching for a bit during the pandemic um, that was about the family that are that have got like a massive company and it's all about their internal affairs so it's, it's a little bit word it's a little bit kind of conversational right there's a lot of conversations going along you have to pay attention to that there's a lot of kind of political games so it's more about that with dragons included but in terms of it following the source material to the T with some kind of creative um, twist here and there, it does a really good job of it. And I think for the most part, if you're a fan of fantasy or you're a fan of the books, I think this is what you really do want because I don't think everything in books translates to on the screen, especially from the books that I've read um, in terms of sci-fi books and whatnot. Some details don't necessarily translate that well on TV series. So sometimes the showrunners and producers, when they take creative liberty to change certain things, like I think in House of Dragon, um, Daenerys and Alnita, the main kind of two proponents of the kind of show um, who are probably going to end up facing off towards the end, no spoiler, they are the similar kind of age. But in the books, if I'm not mistaken, um, Rhaenerys Targaryen is way younger than Elena. I think she's like eight and the Elena girl is like in her 20s or something. But they kind of aged them up with the TV series to make the eventual kind of falling out to hit a bit more. Do you know what I mean? Because they start off as being really close kind of girlfriends and sisters and then they kind of end up being sworn enemies towards the end of it. So that, that kind of creative license, I'm really a big fan of and other things they've done as well towards the end. But it's really good. It follows the books really well, I think. Um, the pacing is done really well. They're kind of ramping up at the end of season. of the, At the end of this episode two, you definitely get the feeling that we're going to start to get, it's going to start to ramp up a bit. There might be a couple of deaths coming along, I, I would imagine so. There might be some twists and turns that we haven't seen already coming up. So I would really implore everybody that hasn't checked it out yet to please check out House of Dragon. And I shouldn't have been surprised. The fact that HBO were producing it would mean that it was always going to be good because they have a really high standard or they have a really high... Um, they have a really high quality standard in terms of the series that they put out they rarely do put out dud episodes or dud series in general so I shouldn't have been surprised that the show is absolutely banging but really and truly it's really kind of caught me off surprise and if anything has kind of reaffirmed to me or reconfirmed for most people how bad um, Game of Thrones ended and what shit job they, those guys did in kind of wrapping that show up because that show was really primed to be something special they rushed it there was no real source material they could kind of lean on because George R.R. Martin's taking fucking ages to finish the books and probably will never finish them because he's busy being a celebrity and enjoying his money and stuff fair enough it's annoying but I guess it is what it is so they kind of tried to fill in the holes themselves and they couldn't necessarily fill it in and they tried to rush it and it ended up being horrible um, and now for the most part most people don't even because imagine how much we all invested in Game of Thrones, how many years that kind of spanned, and hardly anybody, I think, goes back and watches old episodes of Game of Thrones and kind of picks it apart and whatever, especially the last four seasons or last three seasons, right? They're an absolute horror show. But I definitely do think if they do what they should be doing with House of Dragon and kind of keep the pace the way it is and full of the source material and don't veer off too much and do crazy things with it. I definitely do think this could end up being a real all-time classic TV series coming up and it's really handy, especially coming up to the winter months that we have something that we can kind of tune into every week, you know, because I feel like nowadays, especially with how media is and streaming is nowadays, it's very difficult to find TV shows that you can, that you are actually bothered about waiting for it to drop the week that they do drop and you just kind of you know let them kind of pile up and you just bang them all at once but i think the fact that this show is so good and people are having conversations about it on social it makes you want to kind of jump in and watch it when it does drop so you can also lend your opinion and views as to what you see on the screen but i definitely do recommend you check it out house of dragon is absolutely phenomenal i'm having a great time watching it it's really making me kind of fall back in love with everything that surrounds you know um a song of house a song of ice and fire everything that surrounds game of thrones and that whole entire universe and it's and it's actually got me reinvigorated to check out some more fantasy books and get myself in that as well because it does do a good job of kind of transporting you to this other world because if i'm not mistaken it's set like 170 or so years before the events of game of thrones as well so you get to see all the dragons you know you get to see the targaryens at their absolute pomp um you know doing what they do best and it's just an absolute great series i really do recommend it some really good bits and pieces here in there so definitely do check it out if you haven't but i'm sure most people that check out my podcast have probably checked it out already i'm pretty sure next on the list we're going to quickly talk about um 
Should I talk about this now? Yes, yeah, about this now. Or should I move on? No, it's about this. Yeah. So, um, May United's transfers have basically been sealed and done for the most part. Um, most of our transfers in are pretty decent. I have to confess. I don't think they're as bad as I probably would have thought they would be. There's a part of me that thinks all the protest that surrounds the Glazers and the fact that a lot of our fans have finally had enough of the Glazer ownership and there was big protests ahead of the Liverpool game uh, about us getting rid of the Glazers and there's been talk about the Glazers eventually selling up the club and selling their stake in it and selling it to another owner or selling it to another potential owner and all this other talk around in the club. Um, it maybe felt like to me that they were trying to appease the fans or kind of stave off the pressure by essentially giving Eric Ten Hag an open checkbook to sign who he wants. But then if I look back at some of the in the know people on social media, some people earlier on way yet uh, way in the beginning of the summer actually were saying quite confidently that they had been told that Eric Ten Hag would have a hundred would have a two hundred million um pound kind of spending budget to get the players and that he wants. And according to what we purchased so far, that two hundred million is looking about right. Do you know what I mean? So he, I don't think he was ever gonna get any more than that. And I think he's done it, I think he's bought quite wisely um in terms of what he kinda needed in terms of filling in some gaps in quality and whatnot and competition in the club over, overall. Maybe the one thing we probably didn't get or two things we probably didn't get was maybe an extra midfielder maybe a right back and maybe another striker and the striker would have been I think we should have bought a striker regardless if, if Ronaldo was staying or not I think we always need to have a striker in our team an extra one in there especially considering how injury prone Martial is but that, that hasn't happened but so far I can't really complain um, so far we have the likes of um, Lissandro Martinez who's obviously hit the ground running so far uh, Malasia from finals hit the ground running too uh, Christian Eriksen has been a little bit hot and cold but he's done pretty well too Casemiro we've only seen a, a brief cameo and the uh, latest signing is Anthony from Ajax um, for me there's a lot of question marks around him in terms of his fee I do think the fee is a little bit crazy but I have been a fan of his ever since he signed for Ajax a couple of years ago he was somebody that I always enjoyed watching especially when I ended up having to watch Ajax play whether it was in the league or Champions League or whatever I'd always kind of enjoy watching him play because he just you know he's kind of got that Jogger Bonito thing he always kind of comes on the pitch wanting to entertain do some tricks do some skills and just kind of put on a bit of a show he kind of reminds me a little bit of Alan St. Maxim in that, in that regard right he's really kind of going out on the pitch trying to enjoy himself and obviously trying to help his team in the, in the most part but it's interesting because I think like United rarely go for those type of players we don't usually have players in our team who are you know so dynamic and skillful the way Anthony is but the one thing I like about him also is that he is a player who I think has got the grit and determination needed to succeed at the club and also I think he might change the profile of our team and our squad because I feel like for the longest time our team was maybe a little bit too British a little bit too English a little bit too private schoolish a little bit too middle class if that makes any sense it's a bit weird to say those kind of things but I think we were a bit too cute a bit too um, pr prim and proper and we weren't really a team that could get dirty that could have the that or that has a dog in them as i say on social media right we didn't have any players that really had a dog in them but i feel like with the signings of anthony casemiro malasia and Lissandro martinez specifically those are all players that i would say have got the dog in them they've got the fight in them they're ready to kind of roll up their sleeves and really go for it on the pitch and really kind of lay themselves bare in terms of helping their teammates and obviously helping the club go forward and i think anthony is another prime example of that he's definitely somebody who i feel like has got a clear idea of what he wants to do in his career i feel like the fact that he pushed so hard for this move from ix and the fact that he went on strike kind of and he was very adamant that he wanted to go um play for united he didn't want to train he had the interview with fabrizio romano i feel like he has a real clear plan of his career i think him and his team know where he wants to be eventually and a player like him especially a brazilian player we all know, you know, probably his long-term goal is to probably go to Barcelona or something. But I think he views us the same way that maybe Ronaldo viewed us when he moved to Man United from Sporting Lisbon, that that would be a great place to kind of raise your profile, play for a big club, win some trophies, and then eventually in a couple of, you know, eventually maybe in the four years, five years, once you've got some trophies under your belt and you've helped the club, you know, establish themselves again, you can then move on and go to clubs like Barcelona, Roma, and stuff. So that wouldn't surprise me in his future, which kind of makes sense. So I think given that, He's going to come in with a bit between his feet. He's sorry, a bit between his, um, 
the bit between his teeth and he's going to want to prove a point he's not going to want to come in and just kind of rest on his laurels and I feel like the club overall needs those kind of players in our team we desperately 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 need them and I can't wait to see him um, perform on the pitch there's a little compilation here I've got on screen here showing some of his best moments and what he can kind of do and stuff and I'm really eager to see him perform some of these tricks at Old Trafford he's going to definitely endear himself to the Old Trafford faithful especially I can imagine away from home doing these kind of tricks and flicks and controls and what not in crazy stuff he does on the pitch having you know Sancho and Anthony on either side of the wing is going to be fucking incredible the speed the aggression I feel like is going to be great to see I'm also eager to see how he ends up developing his overall positional awareness does he end up developing into being more of a central player does he end up being somebody that only sticks on the wing overall for the long term it's going to be great to see him evolve at the club and kind of turn into a proper world class player that I think he has the potential to be but in general I like that we've changed the profile of the player that we're going for it's a bit bait because you know Eric Ten Hag was previously managing um, Ajax and obviously managed um, Lissandro Martinez and, and Anthony but I feel like we've at least now changed the profile of players in terms of technical ability all of those players I mentioned even the likes of Casemiro and Christian Eriksen are all very technically proficient they're all players who can hold the ball who can you know pass the ball who've got good positional awareness who just know how to play the game have got high footballing IQ which goes a really long way in our team because the team so far has been relying on pure athleticism passion and just whatever else and effort now we've got actual football players who can actually play the game properly so hopefully this will go on to um helping us have a, a somewhat decent season next season or this season sorry i'm not you know i'm not thinking we're going to win the league or anything but i just want to have a decent league finish maybe finish in the top six maybe aim for a top four a good cup run and i'm more than happy with that and then we can build going on to the next season because i think the season's going to be very tough given how the other teams have been performing at the start of it then the next thing i want to point out at the back of it was um this kind of, you know, the propaganda that surrounds United is always really funny. And one of the main things I wanted to talk about was flipping Phil Bloody Jones. Phil Jones is still at the club. I think, what is he? Like, I think I remember, I forgot I checked some of his stats beforehand in terms of how long he's been at the club. He's had like, you know, under 30 appearances. Over, it's, a, it's a crazy amount of lesser appearances he's had uh, after the big transfer that he arrived. And I think folks are saying that he's going to be a future captain of the club. And it never has worked out. A combination of injuries or just maybe him just not not being really up for it but overall he spent the last four seasons or so essentially just like collecting checks and not really bothering to play football and the really annoying part about him is that because he's English and British he's had this amazing PR machine around him that somehow made it so that if you do criticize him and his inability or unwillingness to leave the club to have his contract terminated so he can go and actually play football for somebody else you kind of are looked upon like you're being out of order like you don't have any compassion and then I think last season when some of the rumblings around him were kind of getting really loud and people were kind of trying to call call him out and basically saying why are you still at the club and why are you not kind of trying to make a move and I think Rio Ferdinand has some choice words to say for him this piece came out on Guardian where he essentially tried to fight back against some of the claims that he wasn't serious about the game and and he says here in the title Phil Jones I'd never give up I feel like I'm still good enough right so he has this obviously um this this ego still despite his inability to actually play the game the last few seasons and his unwillingness to actually move he still thinks he's good enough to play for May night which is absolutely bizarre to me but still it doesn't even make some sense because if you're a professional football player you probably have to have some level of ego in order to play the game in the first place but we are now approaching September the transfer window is closing I think today which is Thursday and there still has been no real news oh, don't get me wrong I think the loan window I think stretches further in the week but I know the permanent signing window ends on Thursday and we still have had no word about Phil Jones is he going to leave Man United finally or is he going to keep sitting on the bench and being happy to collect a check and most likely he will and I think the problem I have with it is I'm not really mine because it's not my money I'm not going to pay the guy but I just hate the the kind of double standards that exist on here right when it's a foreign player that's doing the same thing they call them the mercenary they essentially hound them out in the media they don't really have any real nice things to say about him but when it's an english player especially a white player with blue eyes they don't necessarily have anything to say about him negatively and they want to make sure they protect him as much as possible when i think he's actually doing him a disservice by kind of protecting him this way because he probably should be going out there and play for because he's still relatively young he probably still has the ability even though i don't really rate him he probably still 
still has the ability to play for a Premier League side, especially teams like Bournemouth and stuff. He could easily go and, uh, and command a pretty decent wage there, captain to side, and do some good things over there. And who knows if he if he actually plays pretty decently, knowing how Southgate is with these old legends, he might end up back in the England squad again. That's not really it's not that far-fetched but for whatever reason he doesn't really want to uh, or maybe on the back on the other end of it maybe it's just the fact that because he's not been he's been so inactive the last few years maybe there's just no clubs out there willing to take the chance on him because of because of the economy we're in at the moment uh, you'd imagine it's hit football clubs the same way they can't take as many chances as they would do in the past so maybe some of them are looking at him thinking how are we going to take a player who hasn't really played regular football in the last four years and hope that he's the one that's going to lead our back line and be able to organise us and to be able to do, you know, whatever, maybe, you know, allow us to kind of survive in the Premier League, maybe get promotion or whatnot. It's too big of a chance, too big of a risk to take. So maybe they're all not interested. So he has nowhere to go. But I think as a club, if we're a top, top club, the same way that Chelsea, in, the, in effect, I think, terminated Ross Barkley's contract, I think, like, right? Ross Barkley is a pretty young player with a lot of potential around him a lot of hype around him when he was obviously coming up through Everton it probably hasn't you know actualized the way he wanted it to actualize but still he's definitely somebody with a lot of ability and he has been essentially let go by Chelsea who and he has far more ability I think than Phil Jones but for whatever reason Phil Jones is still hanging on for dear life at Man United and I can't wrap my head around it I really want him to be gone because I feel like Phil Jones does represent how poorly we are run as a club and his representation of how poorly our previous regime the likes of Ed Woodward and stuff were in terms of running the club in terms of rewarding players with contracts that shouldn't be rewarded with contracts I think he basically got an extension on his deal under Oli Gunnar Solskjaer which is a nice present he left us with absolute bullshit and now we're basically hamstrung with this guy who clearly is picking up like at least 60 grand per week so he, so he has no reason to leave and he's just living the life in it living a vida loca it's absolute piss take I think in my opinion but hey let's see maybe he does end up leaving hopefully he does end up leaving so moving on to some tough regarding culture that I want to speak about. Obviously, Notting Hill Carnival happened over the weekend. I did not go, um, mostly because I feel like my time at Notting Hill Carnival has been and gone. I feel like uh, I had a good run at Notting Hill Carnival. And also just this year alone, I just didn't really feel the vibe. I may end up going again another time because it happens every single year. But this year specifically, I didn't really feel that kind of drawn to go. Um, especially because I was going out on a Sunday anyway to another rave. I didn't want to go to the rave and then go to Carnival on Monday again. It just felt a bit too much. And the one thing that I hate about it, that most people hate about it, is the way home. I feel like um, even though there's some of the best Caribbean food ever gets served in Carnival because it feels like all the best restaurants and places come down there to show off how amazing their food is, I still feel like that isn't worth it to go all that way just to kind of go for the food. The music is great, of course. You get a chance to wind up on some big batty gal and stuff if you're into that amazing see the floats see all the costumes and whatnot and uh, still still pan bands blah 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 but i just don't think it's worth it to go all to that effort just so you can go there and then have to spend two hours to try to get back home i just can't do it i really really can't and i refuse to do so so i missed out on it but it happens boo hoo hoo but there's been a really crazy video that's been doing around that everyone's been going a bit crazy about which features this girl getting into a bit of a scuffle with somebody i don't know group and then when she gets into a scuffle with a group she ends up slapping some guy and the guy ends up rocking her with a flipping right cross straight to the face and people are going absolutely crazy about it. So i'm going to play it for you and then offer some of my opinions as to why i think um as to what i think about the whole you know encounter so it's going to put it up in your screen let's get it back from the start let's go So if you didn't see this and you watch it just via the um, audio podcast, then essentially there's some sort of argument going on on Carnival. A girl looks like she's trying to get at somebody who, you know, she was maybe fighting with before. A boy steps in and kind of pushes and says, no, you're not going to try and get that person who you're trying to get. And then as those, as the guy and the girl are talking, the girl for some reason slaps the guy around the face. And then he immediately, without even thinking, punches her straight, right hand straight across to the face. And she goes flying to the ground, right? It's a pretty 
aggressive and powerful and aggy punch but by the looks of it the guy is not really i would say unfamiliar with maybe hitting people directly in the face if they try to touch him or come into space so my initial thing to say of course is that i don't condone men hitting women it's not something that i think should be happening under any circumstances but there are some exceptions and i feel like in life in general for me personally whether it's man or woman woman or man in general whatever it may be i feel like most more people especially because i've been a fan of the ufc from you know what recently in the last few years or whatnot and i've been getting heavy into training for that and doing a bit of muay thai and whatnot it may be i've become a lot more I've become a lot more uh, sensitive when it comes to physical education than streets. And I feel like in general, for the most part, most human beings overestimate their ability to fight and, uh, and underestimate their ability of the opponent that they're basically trying to antagonize or they're trying to hit or whatever it may be. But I feel like in general, as a general rule of thumb, most people should always try and keep their hands to themselves and try their best to de-escalate whatever issue or argument they're having with whatever person i don't think you should try to go and resolve things with your hands or try to do it physically in any way because you have no idea who the person is across from you and what they're about and i feel like this is a great instance of it because i feel like most people in this situation if that girl would have slapped them because it wasn't that big of a slap wasn't that serious do you know what i mean like if you just look at the actual video she doesn't even slap him that hard it's kind of like a drunken sort of like you know mush to the face but obviously that guy doesn't take it that well he's not something that he kind of appreciates in the slightest right as he, as he gets kind of mush it's not really something that she winds back on and cocks him back and you know it's not that kind of kind of thing she doesn't scratch his eye out or anything no blood was drawn so it's a little bit aggressive what he did but the thing is the issue is around this is that most men probably wouldn't react to that way and probably would just been all right to just walk off but you don't know what other people are on and we have no idea what this guy's background is we have no idea where he's from we have no idea what he's been through in life and we just know have no idea who he is as a person and i feel like some people when they go out there and they get into physical educations with people they are always estimate or they always basically act as if everyone that they're, they're bumping into is going to be reasonable or somewhat right and i don't think you should have that assumption i feel like most people out there are a flip of a coin away from kind of going on a complete crazy rampage especially in the you know in this world we're living in at the moment considering what's going on in the world at the moment what's going on in society what's going on in the economy people are on the edge so if you really try and push them sometimes people will reveal a monstrous side of themselves that you have never encountered before so i feel like in this occasion the girl should have kept their hand should have kept her hands to herself and i think this case this incident would have been avoided altogether of course the guy went ott with his response and how he punched her but i just don't think this whole incident would have happened if she a did not put her hands on her him, her hands on his face but of course there's people online especially women who have been basically saying there's no place in the world for this sort of violence or this sort of reaction but unfortunately they're not living in the real world the real world has actions and consequences or reaction or you know or an action and a reaction and i think you should always keep that in mind you don't you should never kind of think you're the biggest and baddest there's always somebody out there that can be the big bigger and badder than you no matter how much training you have there's always somebody out there that can maybe fuck you up on any given day and i just think considering you know people out there it's a concrete floor there's loads of stuff on the floor broken glass drugs needles whatever it may be getting into any kind of scuffle could be really um lethal could be really fatal you shouldn't probably be doing it so everybody should avoid all these instances by keeping their hands to themselves but of course it's pretty gnarly to watch so for one more time we're gonna watch it because it's absolutely crazy to see a guy legitimately punch a woman in that way and not give any fucks and as well i don't think the girl was really that rowdy i think she could have been restrained or calmed down in a really effective way if you need be but for whatever reason that guy didn't feel like he owed her that kind of reaction he didn't feel like he owed her that kind of level of sympathy or understanding because she clearly didn't give it to him by putting her hands on him in the first place that punch was fucking greasy honestly absolutely greasy but yeah big up everyone i went to carnival unfortunately that was one of the events everyone kept talking about and making it a big deal um but it wasn't that really big deal to be honest in it hopefully the girl's okay i think she got up and she looked pretty you know well put together after the whole occasion especially after getting knocked in the face so hopefully it didn't go that badly um next on list we want to talk about is this or is it where is it where is it where is it where is it, where is it? let's get this on a page here 
oh mama mia did i get up on you it's not here it's here no it's not here cool so next thing to talk about is this um there's been an update courtesy of high beast concerning matteo blasi's bottega veneta winter 2022 collection and we get to see it in its entirety i think i featured it before in my channel and i spoke about how impressed i was with it how i felt like it definitely did show that matteo blasi was definitely the genius or the real kind of um special person behind Bottega Veneta when it was going through its most successful spell especially before that what's his name Daniel Lee guy ended up getting fired for whatever set thing that he allegedly said or didn't say um in terms of what he called somebody in his office you know whatever nigger nig nog who knows what happened and then Matteo Blasi ended up kind of replacing him because he was somebody that was working in the background and somebody that was responsible for doing some of the more um standout pieces in Bottega Veneta during that time such as the suiting and whatnot some of the knitwear some of the bags some of the boots blah 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 and when Matteo Blasi did end up presenting his first collection with Bottega Veneta I was really impressed by it I thought it was a real cool kind of continuation of the stuff that was under Daniel Lee's tutelage I felt like again like I said it did really illustrate to me that Matteo Blasi was definitely one of the key people behind making Bottega Veneta a big success during that time and it kind of just did feel like a same a bit of the a bit of the same but a bit of the new kind of injected into it and I'm really eager to see what he ends up doing next for his next collection but now we get to see a closer look on the entire pieces I'm going to put that on your screen courtesy of hype beat so you can see what it looks like i've been told via people on on instagram and twitter some of the fashion besties that i kind of know from afar that this look i think it was one of the first looks that came out of the runway is actually all leather so if you're not look if you're not looking at the picture it's basically a classic button-up shirt with stripes with some blue jeans and some dark blue derby shoes or boots but allegedly this actually is actually all in leather it looks like it's cotton or you know standard denim material but it's actually all leather which is quite incredible if you look at it because it definitely does look like a classic cotton shirt with denim jeans but madness so yeah and um, everything around i'm pretty much a fan of i like whatever these cuffling things or these clasps are on the blazers here just at the bottom of the lapels that looks pretty nice the bag is really cool as well they always make great bags and they've got the same sort of material going on on the sandals the tailoring looks pretty awesome too nice use of color the shapes are really nice always like the shoulders on Bottega Veneta it really kind of sits really well maybe the suiting is also something that's very underrated in their collection they've got a nice look here six with the white suit I mean with the white um, vest top with some brown trousers I saw somebody make a really interesting observation about vest tops as well saying that it was a it was what you could it was something that promotes only skinny people or something i forgot what it was it was an interesting kind of quote i maybe try and get up and talk about it next time on the podcast but i thought that was a pretty interesting observation but yeah, regardless um i love this look it looks really clean looks really chic um you've got these amazing boots that are covered in this kind of mesh that we saw this kind of net that we also saw showcase on the runway if i'm not mistaken the same sort of application was done on bags so if you're not seeing it it's basically like the leather boot with like a mesh net around it um which is pretty nice nice and then you've got these leather pleated pants that look beautiful absolutely beautiful and maybe that leather, maybe that vest top is actually leather as well which is crazy a leather vest top right i'm not sure what the perspiration is going to look like or feel like but that's cool nice little bracelet detail there just a little nice to kind of give it a bit of a pop or oh, this white kind of cream off-white look is really lovely look number seven i'm a big fan of that with that double-breasted jacket it's definitely always a win when it comes to men's collection that kind of style of jack i've got the name of it, it's called a nice relaxed sort of look here look number eight with some baggy trousers and some what it looks like might be like skate inspired trainers or something or cat or standard canvas shoes i don't know but they look really nice as well but yeah just a really cool clean collection from what my fairy blaz is doing here at protect vanessa i'm really eager to see what he does next going forward um they did they really did a good job in terms of picking him to be the successor to daniel lee i feel like you know especially considering how how hot Patek Veneta was at the time and the work that they did it would be a real shame if they just went a completely different direction and lost all that steam that they or momentum that they kind of build up so they were able to kind of just take the same person who was working in the design team with the Daniel Lee and basically basically give him free reign and tell him hey just continue doing what you're doing and kind of you know hopefully but so but surely I'm sure he's going to kind of you know make his own stamp on the brand but for now he's just evolving and refining what was already there and presenting it through his lens 
friends and then over time you'll probably just do his own thing and kind of steer in a different direction but I like what he's done so far and I think he looks absolutely incredible to me in my opinion um, is this available online or something what are they saying here what are the quotes um Take a look at the sample garments and looks above and find the entire collection available online or at Bottega Veneta uh, boutiques. So let's check the online store actually. I want to see what it actually looks like. I've never actually been. Actually, yeah, I did go beforehand, didn't I? Yeah, it's always kind of clean looking. I love that they've got the little green hits here and there that we kind of know to be part of Bottega Veneta's codes and whatnot uh, and branding. That wicker bag type thing they got here, which is what is it called? It's called a, a large Calimero bag. These are really fucking nice, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful bags. So I guess it's a bag that kid is wearing here at the front, that first one. So it can go around like that, or you can hoop it in this loop in this little hoop and then put it over your shoulder, I guess, or wear it under your arm. These lug lace up boots are really nice too. Essentially, it's a standard lug boot, but they've now got laces on them. So they look really cool. I'm sure they will end up being very, very popular. Those are really, really nice. I'm not going to lie. Um, the squid mule is really cool too. We got here. The lug boot is back again in a different sort of style, more like a, what would you say? You'd say it's more like a Chelsea boot, right? That shaft here, it's a different shaft detail, but I'd still like the the thing about me about the lug boot that was really popular, that everyone was wearing for a while, and I think a few people even where I live wearing them, was the sole. The sole was absolutely chunky and really aggressive. And if I'm not mistaken, when you look down on it, it kind of spreads out around the entire shoe. So you get this really aggressive sort of like, you know, um, what do you call it? Star Trooper, Storm Trooper sort of vibe with it, right? That you're kind of stomping around the place. See these extra bits of flipping whatever, rubber or whatnot on the outside of it. So you get this nice little look on it. So it looks really cool from the down below. And it's not super squared off as well. It's quite round. So that was quite nice if you were wearing them. And again, those are probably one of the most worn sort of fashion shoes I saw in my everyday life. You know, people wearing the flipping really high, but take of their lug boots um, day to day. So that's that's always a really good endorsement, I think, if you're a designer. People are actually wearing your stuff and not reselling it. I think it's always kind of something that's nice to kind of see. Um, that's nice. And let's think we should go up and check out this lace lug boot. What's the vibe with this and how they've done this? This looks pretty decent too, isn't it? Surprise it's actually all in stock. This looks really nice for a thousand one hundred for this boot. I'm assuming it's going to be made in Italy, probably. Um, really good, really good leather. The only thing I don't like is the laces. They look like they waxed leather laces or something. Oh no, are they waxed leather laces? Maybe they're not. That's the only thing I'm not really big of a fan of. And maybe this crease here in the middle. Once you start wearing them, they might end up creasing really weird here. But so they've got these little slits to kind of help with them. But I'm not sure how they're going to end up flexing. Maybe you have to end up tying them up really, really tight to make them look somewhat decent. But I do like the look of them, to be honest. They do look really, really cool. So, yeah, big up Bottega Veneta, big up Matteo Blasi. And hopefully we see more from him coming up soon. Next on the list, we have some news here, courtesy of Hypebeast, which is quite which is good to see and also a little bit sad because it does remind you that the great man is no longer around. But this is courtesy of Hypebeast. It says the following, Martin Rose, Grace Wells Bonner and Telfar Clemens reportedly front runners to succeed Virgil Abloh at Louis Vuitton. So we all knew this time was going to come. So we, we shouldn't really bury, burying our heads in the sand or getting too sad about it. I think we all kind of understood what the program is and unfortunate as it is that Virgil did pass and someone like myself who kind of was really emotional at the time about it because obviously I had done some small bits of work with him in the past or somebody that obviously followed his career very closely I think a lot of you guys have seen some of the content I've done in the past where I was able to work quite closely with him with the brand also with a company that I used to work for many many years ago so I got to kind of see him up close and personal and follow his journey and I was a fan of his before I joined that company anyway so I got basically got to see the entire thing I went to my first Paris Fashion Week show because of him I was invited to go and see that as well so all that stuff was really cool so I had kind of my own little connection with the guy so when i found out that he passed and you know in the um, you know given the the consequences of how he did pass it was really kind of upsetting for me to kind of see from afar especially also given the fact that i feel like at the time he was alive he really wasn't given the credit or the flowers that he probably deserved to have got when he was around but still that, that aside, I think we all kind of understood, especially us fashion fans, that a big conglomerate like LVMH 
couldn't allow a brand like Louis Vuitton to kind of go without somebody to kind of steer the ship all this time. They were very respectful, I thought, of Virgil's legacy and what he'd done. And obviously, he basically gave them no option but to be respectful because he's an absolute beast in terms of his work ethic. And he was basically able to provide them with many, many collections. I think it was maybe three or four. I'm not too sure exactly on the number. Um, prior, after his, no, what, three or four collections that he already prepared and done. I think the last couple were basically finished by the team by essentially providing them with a lot, a lot of work that they were able to kind of use, um, you know, post, -hom post what was I think, post or whatever, after his death, um, which then obviously gave them time to maybe assess their options, see what was out there, who they could appoint and whatnot, bloody blah, 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 blah. So this time, this sort of occasion was always on the cards. We always knew there will be a time in history or there'll be a time in life where, you know, Virgil will have to be replaced and someone else will have to come in and step into those big shoes and try to continue the great work that he did or to write a new chapter the same way he did after what after the great people that he followed who obviously did some great work at Louis Vuitton also the great thing I'd say about this straight off the bat just right reading the headline I do like the fact that they have shortlisted free black designers I think that me personally I'm somebody that's not really the biggest fan of affirmative action I'm not somebody that's into kind of quotas and whatnot and ticking boxes but I do feel like in some industries when it comes to fashion when it comes to entertainment when it comes to DJing especially in the industry that I'm in it's such a weird industry that is kind of prone to uh, people just giving their friends favors or just kind of keeping it in a little boys and girls club whatever it may be there's a real lack of kind of new fresh talent coming in there is no clear route for people to come in and try to basically make their own voice and make their own angle that you have to sort of put in these kind of thing you have to kind of force it in some ways in order to make some sort of change and i feel like virgil's appointment at Vir virgil's appointment at louis vuitton in the first place i feel like did that in a weird way because a lot of people at the time probably didn't think that he probably maybe deserved to have got that position at louis vuitton because they didn't like the quality of his work he was producing at off-white at the time but the one thing a lot of people would agree with is that his appointment at louis vuitton was more was less about his ability to design clothes and more about what he represents the culture at the time and how he could affect change in terms of inspiring a whole generation of kids coming up to especially you know to pursue a career in fashion and go maybe the um go maybe the uh untra the untraditional way right instead of going for like an you know a traditional kind of education in college and just kind of doing what he did and basically you know doing the work yourself starting your own brand investing yourself and then trying to make it that way and who knows the amount of people he's inspired um that he's kind of you know left to kind of continue on the work that he's basically done which we're gonna feel and we're gonna see many many generations or many many years later in the future so i feel like the fact that they're continuing this this kind of conversation um they're continuing this legacy they're continuing whatever they're doing here by highlighting three really amazing black designers and obviously putting them in a position where they could potentially design under louis vuitton is a really awesome thing personally for me the first person i'd probably knock off that list who i don't think you think works or fits with louis vuitton would definitely be grace war bonner i don't necessarily think what she's doing at the moment is is of the level that you would you know associate with a louis vuitton i don't think her aesthetic really max matches what they're doing either and i still think someone like a grace world bonnet has definitely got room and opportunity to grow and learn some more and there's definitely another brand possibly in the future that she could probably end up taking over but i don't think that's louis vuitton so my front runners will definitely be martin rose and telfar clemens of course if i had to pick and put a gun to my head i'd say martin rose would be my pick i love what martin rose does she's effectively someone that i would describe as like like you know our version of demna here in the uk um she has a very keen and amazing eye in terms of telling the story of like uk culture um without making it seem um without making it seem corny cor cor yeah, corny lame and just kind of overdone she does it in a really clever way immigrant story traditional story whatever it may be the proportions are really interesting it's always really fun the type of stuff that she makes lots of timeless pieces the outwear is always incredibly strong so i think all those are really tick the boxes with louis vuitton and of course telfar what he's been doing in his brand is 
absolutely amazing. It's gone from strength to strength. You you know, we already know if he was to get the job at Louis Vuitton, the shows would be an absolute spectacle. That's 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 for sure. There'd be a lot of kind of um tie in with culture when it comes to music, um, when it comes to representation. That would be something that'll definitely be strong. So those are definitely two front runners who I feel like if any of those guys ended up taking over Louis Vuitton men's, I don't think anyone would be disappointed for me personally. The interesting thing I'm thinking though, going forward, it's a little kind of thing to throw a little span in the work. I wonder, given how poorly I feel like Nicholas Gasquet's work has been at Louis Vuitton Women's, right? I don't think he's, I don't know what's happened to the guy. Maybe he's lost his mojo in the same way that flipping Ricardo Tishy has. Because again, I was a flipping Ricardo Tishy fanboy, but there's no denying the stuff that he's doing at Burberry is really, really bad, um, especially compared to how good his stuff is at Givenchy. So is there, an, is there a um, possibility that LVMH might decide to get rid of Nicholas Gasquet and bring in whoever they want to bring in out of the, those three designers and tell them that they could basically take over the entirety of Louis Vuitton and do men's and women's. That might make a lot more sense in it. Or maybe they might say to the person when they take over the men's that you can do a unisex line. I'm not really too sure because Martin Rose does do really good women's as well. So I wonder if that's going to be or does really do kind of clothes that you could describe as gender neutral or whatever it may be. So I'm interested to know if that will be an, uh, an avenue that they'll kind of um, explore as well going forward. But again, like I said, it's unfortunate this, this is happening now because again, it does remind us that we've lost such a great person, such a great designer, such a great icon in our culture. But again, like I said, the show always must go on. And I feel like Louis Vuitton has done a really good job in terms of honoring his legacy. I feel like it's coming up to a year of his anniversary of his passing. I think he passed in like November, October or something. So the fact that they're only kind of the rumblings are started to kind of get louder and louder now and decided to cover it in these kind of press outlets. This is kind of, I feel like the most respectful thing they could have done. They waited an entire year basically to before they announced it. If I was being ultra cynical, I would say they've probably shown more, I would say, quote unquote, respect to his legacy than his own friends, I would say, right? That kind of fucking dead in Pyrex tears line is coming out before they actually announce um, the success of his own brand, which is interesting. But hey, you know, maybe I don't know what, what I'm talking about when it comes to that sort of stuff. But in general, I feel like, you know, it's something that we all kind of have to kind of um, get come to grips with and kind of accept that this is the nature of business. And unfortunately, they're going to have to get um, the machine back up and running again. And I feel like whoever does come in will end up, you know, honoring Virgil's legacy really well also. But let's read the article anyway to see what they had to say here. Because of Hypebeast it says in the new in a new feature from Business of Fashion, the publication invites fashion industries to ponder the fashion industry to ponder who Louis Vuitton will choose to concede Virgil Abloh as a creative director for menswear. Parent company LVMH has now spent nearly a, a year searching for Virgil Abloh's successor, who died last November at the age of forty one, um, has left an immeasurable space in the world of design and innovation. A pioneer in his field, LVMH continues to be on the lookout for someone to fill the shoes of the colossal creative. The of fashion has obtained sources within the industry that have placed Martin Rose, Grails Wallace Bonner, and Telfar Clement as the forefront to succeeding Abloh. It is important to note that Louis Vuitton has not yet made any decision. Cool. The delayed announcement is not surprising as the role to fill Abloh's position is not only an art director but a cultural giant is complex. Simply put, it is impossible to replace Abloh given that his tenure has transcended the fashion industry and cemented the legacy for himself in both culture and his profession. The that's true but then i think also the great thing about nowadays because most of the people coming up creatives and creative directors and people who are just trying to make it in fashion and kind of have these sort of roles most of them are under the stand understanding that their job is kind of a multi-hyphenate job they've got like a slash 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 kind of role so everyone does everything i don't think there's a creative out there at the moment who's just a pattern cutter who just um is a seamstress who just drapes everyone does everything everyone's got an eye for photography everyone's got an eye for styling everyone can do branding everyone could do marketing everyone could do production like everyone's got some sort of, they've kind of got skills that cover all the bases so then when they end up do getting these big jobs that would allow them to kind of cover a broad remit they're gonna jump at it and run towards it do you know what I mean there's not gonna be a lot of people that are in I don't think there's gonna be a lot of people they're gonna interview who are gonna be like oh that's too much work they're gonna want as much work as possible they're gonna want as much control as possible as much oversight as possible in order to really tell their story and to really present the brand 
the way they want to present it. So that's the great thing about you know the industry or the the culture we're in at the moment. And who knows? Maybe you can credit Virgil for that. The fact that he was so adamant that he wasn't just one thing, right? He was many things, and he did loads of things at the same time. And he was always kind of showing his work and showing his research and what goes in behind it. Blah 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 blah. It continues. It is currently uncertain if LVMH is planning on doing a full image overhaul with its brand and how Louis Vuitton fits in with the overarching direction. With the appointment of Demna Balenciaga, Jennifer Anderson at Louis Abe, and Phoebe Philo at Celine, which we haven't seen still, right? We don't know what the fuck is going on there. No debut so far. I wonder what the vibe is. It, does she Has she got cold feet? Uh, has there been an issue with production? Um, are they just given as much time as she wants because she's the flipping supreme freak of a talent when it comes to fashion I don't really know but I really would like to see the return of Phoebe Philo sooner rather than later because I am gagging to see what her point of view or idea or what she thinks of fashion now at the moment given how long she's been out of the game and given her stature and given where she is in life blah 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 blah, blah. I'm really curious to see what, what she's going to be able to show uh, it continues um, the next creative director should be able to find a balance between storytelling and contemporary era and maintaining the heritage products of the brand it remains to be seen who will succeed for Jabba Louis Vuitton men's creative director so yeah that's the news at the moment so the rumblings have started I'm sure people in the know have already kind of figured out who is going to replace um, Virgil I'm sure that decision has already probably been made behind the scenes they're probably just being respectful and waiting until they announce it properly 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 sorry but for me I would definitely knock Wells Bonner out of the list and I think it's definitely up out of Martin Rose and Telfar Clemens and for me if I had to choose I'd go for Martin Rose but I could imagine them going for Telfar because Telfar you know is very commercially successful the shows will be absolutely incredible in terms of production in terms of an event um, you know he's uh, he's obviously um, profile is just gaining more and more attention over the years bloody blah, blah 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 he's very business minded um, I feel like you know personality wise they, they, they're quite similar you know Virgil and Telfar in terms of how they view themselves and how they view fashion and their role in it being black men bloody blah blah blah, blah. but personally for me I would go for Martin Rose if it was me I think Martin Rose absolutely smashed Louis Vuitton men's if she ends up taking it but again what do I know and then I thought this is actually quite cute too um, this is courtesy of um, Glock Topics um, Offset shared a really cool and intimate little video that he recorded when he went to Virgil Abloh's studio in Paris at Louis Vuitton to go and visit him which is really really nice I'm not really just sure what the point of him going there to, no I'm not really sure what the point of the video is maybe just to tie in in general just to what he's doing in terms of fashion and how he's presenting himself in general but I thought this was really nice in terms of how Virgil was and how people basically looked at him at the time that he was alive and just basically gives us a nice little insight into what the studio was like also so I'm going to play this for you now this is Offset sharing some personal footage of him um, visiting Virgil Virgil Abloh Studio in Paris. Hey, how you feeling? Good, you good? What's up, bro? Ain't shit. Office crazy. <laughs> this is the first time you pulled up. First time. You live in Paris, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you're doing the... I, I really wish I went. The only office I went to or studio I went to was the Off-White kind of temporary studio they had in Paris when he was doing the show out there. But I really wish I ended up having an invite or the ability to go to the Paris Fashion Week or, or to go to his studio in Louis Vuitton in Paris. Because I'm sure back then, if you would have asked him, he's so personable and so nice. If you would have caught him on a good day and DM'd him, I'm sure he would have been fine with it. If you said, hey, I'm in the city, can I roll by? He probably would have let you roll by. Do you know what I mean, that's how nice he was as a dude. That's fire. The logo on the back is fire. The oh, character, yeah. yeah. Oh shit, that's six feet. That's a pen to come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Which of the four? Which of the four you feel like? These are hard. This is a sample, so there's no one even in. Raise. I'll have them take the pins out so you can do an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> take a one. Look in the mirror so you can see the back. Oh, what? God. Oh, Take a photo on the on the gray with it. This on too. That's fire. It's a New York video folded on a block. <laughs> That's light. You know, be curious and then this shit happens. Thanks. Man. Yeah, mad love. Yeah. This shit crazy. Yeah, too. whole sure. vibe, whole everything. You got to set up in here. It's only right. <laughs> oh. That's how we do it. How we do it. All right, I'll catch y'all later. All right. Yeah, peace out. Okay. 
And the caption at the end says, thank you for what you have done for our culture and community. As a black man, you have changed the game in design and fashion. You believed in our youth and you believed in me. You are the culture. Love you, Virgil. Offset. What a touching and beautiful tribute, man. Amazing to see. You see Virgil as well wearing the David Hammond's American flag bandana thing over his face. I think this is during the peak of COVID as well. Maybe he was actually going through what he was going through at the time as well, I would imagine. But just a really beautiful and touching little video there with Virgil kind of giving Offset a little tour of his Louis Vuitton studio in Paris. So really, really nice and touching little tribute to see there. Now, on the flip side, a negative sort of thing to kind of, uh, you know, piggyback off the back of the news that Louis Vuitton are looking for a new um, menswear director is this really tasteless article courtesy of Hypebeast. And this is typical of Hypebeast. And again, I'm speaking from experience because I used to work for Hypebeast a very long time ago. This is like a, what was that? What was I say? Definitely say disclaimer, whatever it may be. I've, I worked for them very, very long time ago when they first started out and they were kind of like evolving from the blog spot into like a proper website. I kind of was doing a little bit of work for them, you know, writing some articles, doing some pieces here and there, did some street style pieces. I read some articles here and there, but I wasn't there for too long. But I, I could say I was definitely one of the first few writers that they had when they were there. And the, the common thing that they always kind of done back in the day was, you know, a lot of their articles and pieces weren't really that heavily well researched. They weren't that well written. And they just generally sometimes, you know, fell on the side of being a little bit tasteless when it came to certain things that they kind of covered. And usually if people complained enough, they would kind of end up taking them down. And I feel like this article is probably one of the same. So what it features is this kind of weird kind kind of street fighter game type design thing they got here where they've got select your design and select your fighter and it's got martin rose telfar clemens and grace wells bonner now i think this is in poor taste because of the nature of Virgil's passing. It's not as if Virgil was sacked or fired from the Louis Vuitton job. It's not as if he moved to another role because he was kind of, you know, he'd done what he wanted to do at Louis Vuitton. He went to go elsewhere. This was him kind of essentially passing away in tragic circumstances and him not having the ability to kind of finish the story or finish the journey that he started. And a lot of people in fashion who were kind of very close to him felt very bad about his passing, maybe because a lot of them didn't know that he was going through what he was going through. So it really caught people off guard and it really kind of hit home, especially considering what he went through prior to his passing in terms of all the weird cancellation things that happened around Black Lives Matter and just in general, the lack of, I think, love that he maybe got from a lot of people that maybe looked like him in the industry, blah, 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 blah. I think when it did end up happening, I think it woke people up in terms of understanding, you know, you know, maybe trying to give people their flowers when they're around and stuff and the circles around it, you know what I'm talking about. So to kind of depict the next hunt for Le Vuitton's next menswear designer um, as some sort of like game is really classless, really tasteless and incredibly disrespectful, I feel like to Virgil's legacy and what he's doing. It really is gross and it's not surprising. Like I said, these platforms, you know, they just want clicks. They just want virality. They want kind of engagement. They don't necessarily care about these individuals in the slightest and any kind of opportunity they can use to kind of game the system and kind of make it work for them. They'll do it. But I'm really disappointed to see this from Hypebeast. I really, really am. This is really, really rotten to the core. And I feel like doesn't necessarily represent at all what happened to Virgil or doesn't honour his legacy in the slightest and I can't really you know there's nothing more I can say about it that's going to be good so I'm going to kind of probably leave my words to myself but I think it's a really really good and if some people are saying it here see horrible job on the image um but yeah some people I guess I'm not really too fond of it but yeah I, I hate it I, I think it hate, I really hate it I don't like it in the slightest and I think they should probably take this down but again what do I know what do I know Moving on from that, we have what else do else we have here that I want to talk about? Uh, yeah, talk about this quickly. So, this is curse. Yeah, so I guess Kanye West is still going on his real. Kanye West seems like he's on a one man mission to expose Gap's management for their gross negligence in terms of how they've handled his collaboration that he's doing with them with Yeezy Gap and Balenciaga. Um, it feels like um the cracks are starting to finally open and I think Kanye is starting to realise that all corporations are the same. I think for a while he was essentially goading and kind of, you know, rubbing it in the nose of other brands he's worked with of how 
well he was being treated at Gap with how valued he felt there um, with how valued he felt at Adidas and whatnot. and I think over the last few months we've definitely seen him go on some tangents or maybe let it be known that both of those companies are not doing right by him but for me I think I've said it plenty of times on here I feel like there needs to be some level of maturity and understanding from Kanye West side of things that if you're going to want to you know get into business with these big corporations you have to realize corporations are always going to corporate they're always going to do what corporations do there is no changing corporations to suit the needs desires and the wants of creatives they're never in that business and i feel like most corporations that get it what they do is that they get really creative people who have incredible ideas who can maybe help their business to come in for a short time you know rebolster their image make a big splash and then they leave after three years but there is no long long-term vision of really long-term partnership that they can sustain because at the end of the day you know executives and in these corporations you know have their own targets they need to hit they have their own demands and their own job and sooner or later those people are going to try to get their fingers noses and tongues and toes into the pie and try to add whatever they can add so that they can say they did something too and then of course those are things that creatives absolutely hate it's like giving it's like being given notes on a show that you produce yourself about your own life story so it's always going to end in tears but for some reason Kanye seemed hell's bent on trying to single-handedly change the way the record industry does business the manufacturing industry does business the way corporations do business and I feel like to me it's a it's a kind of loser's fight I feel like the best thing to do is to set yourself up and put yourself in a position where you can do your best work in a very short space of time like I said three to five year partnerships and then as soon as that partnership comes to an end shake your hands shake the hands of the people that you worked with and move on to your merry way but you know Kanye I think is also understanding that the level of stuff that he wants to do at the level that he wants to do it in terms of providing clothing and the accessibility to good products and good fashion and good you know whatever um housing whatever it may be to a wide range of people he has to work with corporations because they have the ability to produce those things on mass to a very high standard he probably hasn't got the ability to do it so at the moment so if that's the case um fair enough but you also have to accept that they're going to you know want to get their noses involved as well and it feels like hey that's a basically oh sorry, sorry gap are doing that at the moment the first thing he was kind of moaning about was this kind of um screenshot taken from his instagram which basically looks like somebody has kind of shared with him an image taken from the gap website that basically looks like gap are essentially copying um the shape and the color tone and silhouette of the shirts that he produced under the Yeezy Gap Balenciaga moniker and in the screenshot you've got an image taken from the Gap website and it shows a model wearing a t-shirt with Gap and blazer that looks quite similar to what Kanye did under his own Yeezy Gap Balenciaga thing and the person says in the comments here in the chat this is Gap copying, you know, Yeezy Balenciaga. And um, Kanye says, exactly. Oh, no, the person said, um, exactly. Do you want me to post this text message, right? And, of course, the, post, the text message gets posted. And then the next thing we see is this really incredible clip, actually, that I'm going to play for you, where it looks like Kanye is in a meeting with people, with some of the hires up involved with Gap. And he's essentially give them a dressing down. Because I imagine this has something to do with this clip or this post that Kanye posted that I kind of mentioned before where he posted a picture of the glasses that he has in his collection and the caption says Gap held a meeting about me without me so I'm guessing that made some rumblings or made people take notice at Gap they called a kind of fireside meeting a quick meeting or stand up they wanted to do in terms of kind of clear the air and Kanye took the opportunity to do what Kanye does and to basically give them all the big dressing down which is pretty sick to see um, him kind of addressing everybody at the Gap um you know at the gap upper management the way he's doing and i think as a creative myself it's quite cool to see somebody like him talking to people of that kind of level in this way because sometimes there can be a little bit of a um what you think called they can be a, you can sometimes get intimidated when you're creative and you're in rooms with these kind of executives but at the core of it these people are there you're in the room with them because they feel like you can contribute something to what they're doing so there should be a partnership you shouldn't feel inadequate to what they to them anyway and usually at the at the level that you're doing your thing or what your kind of skill set is they have no idea how to do that job so you should basically be telling them what to do you shouldn't be inviting 
you know, notes or opinions and whatnot. You should be telling them exactly what you want um, to get the job done. And if you can't get agree on that, then you should be walking. So maybe what Kanye is saying here makes complete sense, but it does really look funny him dressing them down. These big executives who you know met, who basically who command massive wages and are in charge of big teams, and here's Kanye basically giving the dressing down, wearing his sleeveless flipping hoodie. It's pretty funny. This is Sparta. This is not celebrity marketing. This is not a collaboration. This is a life mission. I didn't understand why I love Louis until I learned about Mark Jacobs. I didn't understand why I love Gucci until I learned about Tom Ford. I didn't understand why I love Ralph Lauren until I learned about Ralph Lipschitz. I didn't understand why I love Yacht until I learned about Mickey. Me and Matt and George brought season six and showed Mickey and he grabbed the stuff and his response was, oh, it's too good. So I'm not going to be please Terry back, this, that, that, something that can hit that old Navy price with the cut. And we go and we do TV commercials and we open up that store, we look at those stores and we go through those racks and look at that product, whatever, and put that other shit in the outlet and put they shit in the front. <laughs> throughout every single Gap store, and let's go take the JC Penney store, it's not where I had it. He does make some good points, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but he does make some good points about their lack of um, being on the ball, like the fact that they didn't design, they didn't put together a fashion show for the Yeezy Gap Blanchard collection, the fact that there wasn't many TV adverts, even though one of the first ones did well, the fact that allegedly they took the pre-orders down for the blue um, jacket that you can't button up, that I don't know what it was called, it's a balloon jacket, whatever that one that was did really well, that sold in a crazy number of units. Um, loads of really interesting points that he kind of raises, but the one that I love at the end is this, <laughs> towards the end. I think this is really, really hilarious. Let's play this close with the end. Let's play this bit. How do we go Costco? How do we go Old Navy prices? And I'm there in factories with no heat. I'm there, no security, no heat, no gold watch, no chains, learning how do we get this to the high schools and the high schools they believe. I said, this is bigger than us and we shouldn't argue amongst ourselves. But I'm saying I have to go pull that sword out of stone. You either believe me or I'm gonna show you. I'm either gonna show you faces this way, I'm gonna show you faces this way. But you're gonna see it. Don't fucking clap. You guys are gonna get the position on the quit. Okay, get it. No, it's not a fucking joke. In Virgil's name. In my mama name. <laughs> Don't fucking clap. You guys have put me in a position where I feel like I'm going to quit. In Virgil's name or my mama's name. So clearly, all the rumblings we've been hearing about Kanye behind the scenes in terms of these issues with Gap have clearly been illustrated here. He's clearly going through some growing pains or some relationship pains or partnership pains, whatever it may be. But for me, the thing that's really interesting, because I said before, corporations are always going to cooperate. I feel like the funny thing as well is that you're seeing it clearly now because Gap was on his knees prior to Kanye coming in. And he has single handedly revived them because he cares about the brand. And I think he mentioned it himself. He actually is personally invested in gap he's always wanted to design for gap i think he's spoken about being you know have been having a line at gap or doing his own thing at gap for, for many many years ago so it's definitely something that he was always it's always something been like kind of been like a bucket list um, thing that he's always wanted to pursue so the fact that he single-handedly chose them for a partnership he probably feels like they're not take they're taking it for granted because he probably could have rocked up to any brand that needed a breath of fresh air that needed to be revived and they would have been happy to give him the keys to everything and he could have done whatever he wanted right think about brands like puma think about brands like elisi think about brands like fila whatever it may be right all those kind of brands are on their knees and struggling if they would be super over the moon and happy to have kanye kind of come in and essentially try to bring them kicking and screaming into the 21st century and he specifically chose gap and now gap are essentially taking it for granted but he also shows, like I said, that corporations are always going to corporate because he is single-handedly bringing them into modernity, bring it, making them cool, making them relevant, especially with the youth market. And if he continues doing what he's doing, 
he could, in theory, turn Gap into being the new version of Uniqlo for these kids coming up. Because when I was coming up in the industry or when I was coming up on the scene and I wanted to wear stuff that was somewhat linked to the scene that I was in in terms of streetwear and menswear, some of the things that I could get in terms of basics, I got them from Uniqlo, especially when Uniqlo first started in the UK. I was quite young when it was here and I would buy like basics like chinos. I'd buy basic like Oxford shirts, um, like um, selvage denim poplin shirts short sleeve shirts shorts t-shirts and whatnot all from there as in basics so i could easily see a future where kanye turns his yeezy gap um engineered by whoever collection into one of those sort of staples and that kind of makes really classic essentials and quote-unquote basics that people can wear year round and they just kind of refine and hone these different silhouettes seasoning seedless and out with really nice and cool and fresh colors that kids can wear again and again and again and again so clearly he sees a much much bigger role Role for this and for every reason the gap management doesn't see it that broadly or doesn't have the vision to see that far but again like i said corporations are always going to cooperate because they have no reason to doubt what kanye's influence or impact could be because they see it firsthand but they're still kind of being lackadaisical with it or essentially doing their own thing and essentially pissing him off but i still think there needs to be a level of it's the same maturity but it's not even maturity it's just understanding i think for kanye that he's never gonna i think not never, but it's going to be really difficult to try to turn these corporations into being perfect partners for creatives. I don't think that's their mission. I don't think that's their position. I don't think that's their kind of role in society in general. I think corporations should always be a vehicle where creatives can go in and do some work and make an impact. But I think overall, they should serve as a kind of counterweight to what people do in their everyday life in terms of creative output. There shouldn't be a platform that you can go to to basically do your most creative work. There should be a place where you can maybe create to a certain level and then bounce and do your own thing. I don't think that should be, they should be like long, long-term partnerships because I think about other collaborations over the years, they don't really last that long. They always kind of, you know, are short-lived. They make an impact and then they bounce and then you kind of remember them in the years gone by. And I think that's what kind of should be doing that gap. But the thing with Kanye also is that he does these amazing things. He pushes the envelope. He tries his best to kind of make these things work. And eventually he doesn't end up seeing the fruits from it, but the, uh, the generation coming up behind him end up do. So maybe this is what was going to end up happening with this collection. He's going to end up fighting the good fight with Gap and then they're going to end up fucking it up or maybe deciding to go separate ways. And then people coming up underneath him are going to end up kind of, you know, enjoying the fruits of his labor because companies are going to see maybe they should have given Kanye more of a, you know, of Alicia should do his own thing and they're gonna want no Alicia's is a bad term but you know they're gonna give they're gonna give the new generation more room to kind of grow do their own thing going forward so maybe he is doing a good thing all included so moving on from this so we'll just talk about this what was it yeah this is interesting so let's talk about this so this is courtesy of um resident advisor so it's an update on the beatport nonsense that's happening at the moment right i think i covered it before where former beatport employees were alleging that people within upper management were you know bullying and doing casual racism and sexism and all this sort of nonsense and basically you know creating a very toxic work environment and the main ceo there rob mcdaniels really came out of it looking terrible right because he seemed to be very out of touch and just seemed to be like a completely ignorant person who probably had no business being the ceo of such a um illustrious and important brand within dance music right somebody that probably shouldn't have that position in the slightest because he doesn't really know what's going on in culture he has no idea his position he has no idea on what you know the history of the industry she is like zero he's just completely clueless and ignorant and seems like those kind of people that is just wrong and strong for all the wrong reasons so there's been an update here courtesy of resident advisor where it says the Beatport CEO rejects claims of toxic work culture and calls the Vice article so disappointing. So the Vice article, I'm assuming, went through all the journalistic standards, loads of research, loads of cross-referencing, loads of kind of double-checking to make sure the things that were said were actually said. But of course, the Beatport CEO says it was all nonsense, it all didn't happen, and the article was disappointing. So let's see what he has to say. Rob McDaniel, CEO of Beatport Group, has disputed allegations of a toxic work culture at the music retailer 
similar where um, that were brought to light via a recent Vice article. In a statement on Beat Paul or last week, McDaniels called the Vice piece so disappointing, saying he disagreed, disagreed with the overall portrayal of the company. How about him then? Journalist Annabelle Ross has detailed multiple allegations against workplace racism, bullying and sexism advice, signaling that McDaniels Chief Revenue Officer Jonas Temple and former Berlin Officer General Manager Terry, whatever his name is. Um, while disagreeing with the article's main message, McDaniels says he sincerely regrets any unjust and unfair treatment of any employee during his time there. Does he regret talking about African tribesmen when that woman was talking about talking about George Floyd and stuff? Does he regret that? He continued. He added, the article doesn't speak to any of the progress and the growth the company has made over the past years to raise awareness of our staff and diversity and work collaboratively within the broader community to shine spotlight on the very issues of our industry. The statement also listed 10, 10 accomplishments related to the diversity and inclusion of Beatport over the past two years. These include statistics such as 70% of the engineering team being women on non binary Ah, oh, mate. He's using the same things that they're doing against him, against them. God almighty. Of course, to McDaniels is the above average of software companies to close the statement listed various internal and external projects related to diversity awareness and inclusion many of which according to the statement are ongoing these include unconscious bias training creating a memorial page for George Floyd <laughs> honestly this guy is taking a piss he's so tone deaf it's unbelievable so in order to kind of respond to the allegations of creating a toxic work environment and casual racism, he's now only creating a memorial page for George Floyd in 2022 on Beat Portal. Are you for real? Make International Women's Day and Juneteenth company-wide holidays. Holy shit. The allegations in Ross' article are numerous and wide-ranging. McDaniel's cash racism on a Zoom call and the other person obliterating junior employees to Temple mourning the late Eric Marilla. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Did that guy have a, what, like a day of remembrance or a moment of silence for Eric Marilla? Oh, my God. Who has accused of multiple accounts of rape and allegations? The accused account accepts some of the allegations or rejects others. And the quote here says, Beatport is not a place that shuns diversity and equality. We embrace it, says McDaniels. No, you don't. Beatport is not a killer of voices. Yes, you are. And ideas, we cultivate them. No, you do not. We have been through some challenges at the time and have been historic, have not been historically perfect, but we are far from toxic culture described in the article. Following Ross's article, Black Artist Database suspended his partnership with Beatport or their editorial arm, um, Beat Portal, and as it conducts an internal review. So they still haven't made a final decision, Black Artist Database, which is hilarious to me. But again, I understand they're a small team, as someone's mentioned in the comments. They probably got other things they're dealing with, bloody blah, 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 blah. I just find it hilarious that they're still in the internal review stage, despite everything that we read in that flipping incredible article, courtesy of Annabella Ross. Now, personally, for me, I feel like this is absolute nonsense, personally. Let's actually see his statement. Let's actually see the things that he's kind of listing as achievements. Because let's just see his achievements and what he feels like Pete Port has done over the years to kind of rectify this reputation they have of having a toxic work environment. Because it's all one, it's all well and good laughing at this sort of stuff, but if they're making efforts to change or they recognize if they've done bad, then maybe that's a good thing. So let's see. Let's go through the 17 things. One, 40% of our main division senior management is female and non-binary. Okay, seventy percent of our engineering team is female non-binary. Okay, live streams average one third female non-binary and bi-pop performers. Really, I don't think that's true. Playlists and featured have minimum artist target of twenty-five percent female and non-binary. That's probably a pretty decent thing to put in place. Established um, mandate for all recruiting and high. Oh, sorry, can I zoom in? Probably this or not. I can't zoom in. So disappointing. Anyway, cool. You can't zoom in. Okay, cool. Let's go back here again. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Come on, where are you? Where are you? Is that the achievements? Oh, we got that. right there. Um, okay, ten achievements. So, uh, established mandate for all recruiting and hiring efforts to focus on gender balance results. This includes the following of our uh, fair processes and equal opportunities policy. To be honest, though, what they put there, the top five. As much as I like to laugh about it, this is probably more than most clubs do. Most nightclubs don't have this, even on their lineups. They don't have these kind of things in place where they basically be like, okay, cool. We're going to try to make sure our lineups or the club nights that we put on, the DJs that we have on our roster are 25% this and that. Do you know what I mean? I think I've even followed a place that I love. Their entire resident DJ lineup is just full of white people. Do you know what I mean? It's like zero. No one, I guess you can maybe say sexuality and stuff is a bit different or how they, um, what's that word called? Um, 
whatever the term is, whatever how they present in terms of um, pronouns and stuff can be a bit different. But in terms of what they're presenting, in terms of what I can see with my eye, it's just basically loads of white people. Do you know what I mean? Which is quite funny considering how multicultural fold is as an institution. So, you know, even fabric is the same thing as well. So it's I feel like even though I, I should laugh at this and point and take mick at it, they're still doing more than some nightclubs do. And they get complete ply on it. Do you know what I mean? So let's continue. Um, number six, establish a goal to achieve one third representation by the end of 2023 across all leadership positions for female, non binary, and BIPOC candidates and believe that we achieved this metric ahead of schedule. It's just so gross to be listed under BIPOC in it. Like, I don't want anyone to refer to me as fucking BIPOC. Like, fuck that shit. Honestly, it's fucking awful. But in this industry, you kind of have to lean into these things if you actually want to get anywhere because it's so fucking difficult to get in and people don't necessarily want to leave the door open. So the only way to do it is to kind of lean on their um, lean on their fucking um, compassion or whatever sympathy that they're trying to portray, understanding or whatnot, and use that to your advantage and then try to basically show and prove once you get the opportunity. That's it, really. But I'm, I'm sure there are people in there that are taking advantage of it, right? That listed themselves or that are trying to fly under the banner of BIPOC and then when they get in, they're fucking terrible at what they do. And But then people are too afraid to tell to tell them that they can't do what they do or they're too afraid to sack them because they look bad. I don't know. But I just, I would hate to be referred to as a BIPOC fucking DJ or BIPOC artist. Like, go fuck yourself. Historically, it's number seven says, historically more than 90% of the DJ's customers have been male, but we're working in the organization to incorporate more diverse voices and communicate tactics to appeal to a broader what how are you going to try to increase them that's an interesting thing evidenced by our recent campaign of great hundred hundred dollar fund to ideas promoting gender diversity so they've got a fund going on to improve di gender diversity that they feel like is going to help them attract more customers that aren't male that's the that's the unfortunate kind of reality of where the scene is at the moment right this is what it is. For as much as they want to push whatever they want to push in terms of representation, the unfortunate reality is that 90% of the customers who buy stuff on Beatport are men. Cisgendered men, I'd imagine for the most part, right? Maybe less than 90. Maybe they, let's say 8% are cisgendered men. The rest are maybe, you know, um, that kind of occupy the, you know, the range in terms of queer and LGBTQ and gay and whatnot. But that's a lot of dudes, right? So you're going to have to try to somehow get all those dudes on board with all the stuff above here it's not an easy task at all in the slightest especially in the industry where i feel like most people generally don't give a fuck about all this stuff i feel like they, they just basically play nice and act like they do because they don't want to get cancelled online but i think in real life they could care less for the most part because it doesn't actually affect their actual day-to-day -day life i don't feel like but hey what do i know it continues Number eight, creation of a diversity, inclusion and social action committee in early 2020. I don't know what that means. It's just loads of buzzwords. Um, creation of a diversity, and inclusion, social action. What does that do? What have they done though? They created it, but what they do? So that's a bit of a loose nonsense one. Number nine, establishment of a variety of ongoing DNI training, um, diversity and inclusion, I'm assuming, right? DNI training. <laughs> education programs for management across the business what are they going to do on those DNI trainings are they going to play fucking love and basketball to the fucking management team to get them to understand black people or some shit like, what are they going to do <laughs> number 10 supported numerous non-profit organizations in our community over the past few years with sponsorships and fundraising efforts to raise money for gender inclusion and equality issues in our community society you know what this reads like this reads like you know when you're doing your cv and you put your job experience and you put your achievements underneath and you just start listing things that you had nothing to do with to kind of make yourself look better this is what it basically looks like just list of stuff that does nothing doesn't really add to anything doesn't really say much in general because personally for me i believe the article that annabella ross wrote i believe what those people said in terms of how they they experienced in terms of what they went through there and it's unfortunate but at least for the most part they're acknowledging it and they see that they've not made you know they're trying to make amends but i believe everything that's written in the article i don't feel like it was disappointing or it didn't reflect what they what they what they are as a company or how they are as a company just look at that <laughs> i don't know you know what i mean i don't know look i don't know i don't know i don't know it's all nonsense like I said, for me, I don't, I don't necessarily see any big change here coming anytime soon because I feel like, you know, we already have less people really giving a shit about women getting assaulted and raped and shit at festivals and whatnot. If people don't give a fuck about that in the hospitality industry that I would imagine is, you know, predominantly sort of dominated by women 
in an industry like dance music, then I don't think all this sort of stuff is going to go anywhere anytime soon. If anything, this conversation is maybe good to have because it kind of raises people's awareness and it maybe allows people that look like myself to kind of have the opportunity to maybe start some things, gain a fund, maybe slip through the cracks and get like an affirmative action sort of like DJ gig somewhere and then use that to boost your profile. There are some things that you could do. But overall, will it actually change anything? I don't think so. I'm too pessimistic about this shit. I've seen too much horrible things in this scene for me to feel like a few bullet points and a flipping one note on the sheet of paper on a PDF is actually going to change anything for me personally. But I do appreciate the Vice article, Curse of Annabella Ross. I feel like everyone should check it out if they haven't already because I feel like that's going to definitely make a change going forward. But anyway, that is Young Show episode number four. What is it? Eight, nine. I think that's it. Four, eight, nine. Was it four, eight, nine I said? Or 497, one of them. 597? I think it's 597. No, it's 598. One of them, anyway. It doesn't matter which one it is. Thank you so much for tuning in. The pleasure of your company. If it's the first time, check out the show. It's but usually you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. And I'll see you guys again very soon. If you're watching or listening via the audio podcast, you hear a song of the day. If you're listening or watching via the YouTube, you'll hear nothing. You'll go to black. But until then, peace out.